probably know someone struggling to raise a child and stay fit. In our increasingly busy lives, it can be hard just to keep up. I understand. My name is Casey Jones, and I'm a parent balancing the same demands. The job of a parent is to raise children and show them the way they should go. And one of the best ways to go is on a bike. In our series, Positive Spin, we'll show you how cycling can benefit you and your family. My first guest is Kelly Dooley, director of the MS Lone Star chapter. Kelly, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Before we get started talking about biking on the one, let's see, it's the MS-150. Mm -hmm. What exactly is MS? Well, KC, MS is a disease, first of all, there's no cure for. Um, some common symptoms of MS, which is a progressive disease, um, loss of balance, extreme fatigue, uh, temporary blindness, or blindness, um, the temporary loss of your limbs. Mm -hmm. And what's so devastating about MS is these symptoms come and go. Uh, it's a very devastating disease, usually diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 50, mm -hmm. twice as often in women than in men. I see. But the good news is there are six drugs that slow the progressiveness down, and these were just discovered in the last 10 years alone because of funds raised from the MS-150. Well, excellent. So tell me a little bit more about what the ride the MS-150 bike ride has to do with MS. How did that get started? Well, we were looking for ways to, to raise funds uh, for people that we serve in the Lone Star chapter, which is about 17,000 people. Wow. Um, each cyclist is asked to raise a minimum of $300, which is due a month after the ride. Okay. And um, it's really a, a tremendous effort. Most of the, our riders are in it because of the cause. They know someone with MS or a coworker or a friend. So when someone's diagnosed with MS, it affects a lot of people around them. That sounds like a lot of fun. Let's take a peek and see what this event's all about. I'm riding for everybody that has MS. I've, I've been riding for a few years. I've never done anything of this distance, so. Oh, why did he? God, if as long as you give it yourself, you're someone special. So I want to you all are special for being here. Thank you, I love you, and God bless you. MS-150 looks like a blast, but I'm afraid I'm not brave enough to ride that far, 150 miles, and I have a seven-year-old. Well, KC, I, I go around and talk to a lot of people about the MS-150, and it really should be named the MS-whatever-you-can-do, because that's literally what it means. When you register to ride our ride, you can ride as little as long as you want, one mile, 50 miles, the whole thing. Uh, that's why our ride is so popular because uh, just like I said, you can ride as little as long as you want. We have vans that go up and down the route looking for people that just can't make it to you know the whole thing. They, they'll pick you up, they'll take you to the next rest stop, which are located every 10 to 12 miles on the route. Oh, okay, so if I felt like I could just ride maybe even from the beginning uh, in Frisco, mm -hmm maybe even just 10, 15, 20 miles, however far that I felt my daughter and I could go, sure. then there's plenty of accommodations to provide for us. And I know this is coming up soon. Um, tell us a little bit about the event that's coming up, this MS-150, where and when. Okay, thank you. It's, it's May 5th and 6th. As you said, it starts in Frisco at the Dr. Pepper Ballpark. The first day is about 80 miles with rest stops every 10 to 12 miles with the vans looking for people to get that need a lift. Uh, it ends at the Texas Motor Speedway on oh. the first day. Cool. It's a huge tailgating scene, lots of people walking around in spandex, it's quite a sight. Uh, Sunday morning, they do a lap inside the track itself, and then finish on, in uh, Sundance Square in downtown Fort Worth for, with a huge 
scene of bands and people watch them cross the finish line. It is a tremendous, tremendous feeling. That sounds like a lot of fun. Approximately how many people do you expect to do an event like this? This year we are expecting around 3,500 people. Um, wow. It's uh, like I said, it's all ages and abilities. Okay. You, you won't see a bunch of shaved arms and legs on the <laughs> route. It's a bunch of people like you and me wanting to get out, have a good time, and do it for a tremendous cause. Well, that's even better. I don't have to shave my legs before <laughs> I go on the ride. That sounds like a benefit to me. Right. Well, wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this. I am definitely going to be there on May 5th in Frisco and on May 6th in my hometown, Fort Worth. Until then, I'll be listening to energizing music to get me motivated. Find out more right after this break. Mental illness affects every segment of our society, our family members, our neighbors, and our co-workers. I am eight years old. I am Ethan's best friend. I am a spelling bee chair. I am not my mental illness. I am a student. I am a painter. I am a dreamer. I am not my mental illness. I'm a professional. I'm an athlete. I'm a father of two. I am not my mental illness. People with mental illness deserve respect, just like anyone else with a medical problem. Please help break the stigma. Our next guest not only spins spokes, he spins vinyl. If you could use more power to ride, Eddie Alcaraz has it. Eddie is the station manager of my favorite nonprofit radio station, 89.7 Power FM. Hi, Eddie. So how are you doing today? Doing good. Thank you so much. Well, it's so much fun to have you on my show. I listen to your shows. So tell us a little bit about who you brought today and, and all about how cycling and the radio are coming together. Sure. Well, I brought my friend Johnny. He is a listener and a bike rider. And we've decided kind of to merge those two things together at Power FM. Actually, uh, starting way back in 99, the Morning Brothers and myself decided to ride in the Grand Prairie Grand Prix bicycle ride. And we said, hey, why don't we announce it on the radio and ask listeners to join us? <laughs> so it's kind of been an ongoing tradition since then. And then uh, just this last year, we met Johnny. Actually, we had met Johnny before in our office, but I didn't know he was a bike rider. But then he heard us talking about the Mesquite Rodeo bike ride. And he joined us for that last year, so it was a chance for him yeah. to it was a lot of fun. bicycle with us and meet some of the other listeners as well. So Excellent. Well, and Johnny, I understand you've actually ridden the MS-150. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, the MS-150 is an excellent ride. It's, uh, it's very well organized. Uh, it's a lot of fun. They've got bands. They've got mm -hmm. great stops. They all have themes, and people will just treat you. They'll grab your bike if you hold it while you get your banana and your orange and stuff. So it's a really great organized ride. It's a lot of fun. So you've done the whole, the, the whole, whole yeah. The first day is 85 miles. The next day is 65 miles. Okay. Second day, it's hard to sit down on your seat. Mm. So. Well, how about <laughs> you, Eddie? Have you ventured out on the whole 150 mile? MSC? No, no. I actually uh, am more of a casual rider. I ride a mountain bike, and I'm not a he-man like Johnny <laughs> here doing the Lance Armstrong thing. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the things that's fun about these rides, uh, whether it be the Peach Pedal in Weatherford or the Collin Classic, or is like Johnny said, there are these pit stops. And it's really a great time for fellowshipping, and it's fun. You pull over and you get snacks, fruit, cookies sometimes, Gatorade, and re re-energize yourself. And so it's a lot of fun. And uh, you know what I learned is it's not a race. It's a ride, and it, I thought I'd be the only one riding on a little mountain bike. No, there are people riding all kinds of bikes with their little chihuahuas in their baskets. Oh. And so it's more, of a, it's more of a fellowship thing, not so much a race, and there are people of all different levels, which is neat with the Power FM group that we got together. Uh, a lot of us are just amateurs, so we're riding the lower rate rides, 30 miles, maybe 25 miles. And then we have guys like Johnny that they ride together in fellowship, and they ride like the 60K or the longer rides. So there's something for everybody. And um, we all meet up afterwards and eat lunch together usually. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun. That sounds great. So how do people find out more about being able to participate in events? And uh, do you have a website or? Uh, yeah, they can actually find me, Eddie Alcaraz, on our website on the contact page. So they can go to kvrk.com. Okay. It's kvrk. Dot com, and if they find my contact, they can email me and say, hey, I'd like to know more about your biking group and fellowship. And then I'll forward their email to Johnny, 
And I think he's going to kind of keep the bunch of emails together for us and help us stay coordinated as to what we want to do. Because we've actually been talking about not only doing some of the organized rides, but just meeting from time to time at some of the trails. Just do regular trail rides. Uh -huh. And where do you guys normally ride? Are you uh, mostly over in Dallas, or do you have some group over in Fort Worth yet, or do all over the Metroplex? The plan is to rotate around the city, so we'd go to Fort Worth or to Dallas or to wherever there's places to ride. We're planning on circulating through all of them, I think, is what we're planning on doing. This is the first year, so we're, you know, everything's kind of in flux. But So you guys be have been riding kind of um, unofficially, and now you're putting something together a little bit more official. Exactly. Tell me a little bit more about your plans for... Uh, what you're going to be doing with your group. How, do you, how are you changing this from unofficial to official? What are some of the things you're doing? I'm dependent on Johnny to help <laughs> lead that ministry. And well, that's really what it is, the ministry. In fact, he's producing a jersey, a power from jersey. And we hope to let people see us and hopefully tune into the station and, uh, you know, realize that, hey, you know, we can listen to Jesus music and be regular people who exercise and have fun, too. Yeah, and you'll be getting your jersey soon. Excellent. Yes, <laughs> I know. I wish I had a, a copy of that. I'll have to see about putting a, a copy of the jersey on my website, which oh, is yeah, areyoukeepingup.com. But that's going to be a lot of fun. So let's see. Um, you're going to ride in this MS-150 yes. coming up in May? Yes. Okay, how about you, Eddie? Do we have a yes? Do no, we unfortunately. Yeah. We're going to be having our fundraiser, our share annual share uh -huh. that we have in May. So. We'll be very busy, but uh, I look forward to the emails and deciding what pass we're going to go to as well as what organized rides. If we want to do the Mesquite Rodeo bike ride again this year or if we want to do the Colin Classic, I guess we'll hear from uh, the people in the riding group and see what we want to do. And you need to come <laughs> ride with us, Well, too. I would love to. I'm definitely looking forward to it. And, you know, I'd just love to listen to the music on 89.7 Power FM because it just Thank really you. gets you pumped up. So it's so much fun. But before you get out there pumped up, ready to ride, you also need to make sure you know the seven laws that the state of Texas has for riding on the road. So coming up soon we'll have Elaine Williams from the Texas Bicycle Coalition and she's going to teach us one of those laws right after this break. If you thought all museums were the same, think again. For action-packed adventure and entertainment, thrills for the whole family. Visit the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame in Fort Worth. No guts, no glory. The National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame. A cultural experience that'll take you for a ride. We're back with Elaine Williams of the Texas Bicycle Coalition. Elaine, I know that I see kids blowing through stop signs, and I know I hear a lot of complaints from drivers that they say, you know, these bicyclists, they just don't ever stop. Well, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because there are some bicycle laws. Doesn't that apply? Yes, it does. It is a Texas state law that uh, bicyclists stop and obey all traffic signs and signals, just like a car would do. Um, when you're, I know sometimes when we're on bikes and we're riding and we're coming down a hill and there's a stop sign there, we don't want to stop because we're kind of on a roll, but you do need to obey all traffic stop signs and other signals. Okay, yeah, stopping, it's a law. Another law that a lot of people don't seem to realize is that kids are supposed to wear helmets. So would you show everybody real quick how to properly fit a helmet on a child? Because I know sometimes I see them pushed way back or they're not even, they're not even hooked underneath. So Bailey, will you let us put a helmet on you real quick? Okay, great. Thank you. Elaine. Okay. Let's see how we're supposed to do this. We are supposed to. This is the front of the helmet. The back is a little bit has a little bit of bulk to it, so it will protect the back of your head. If you fall, you need to put the helmet on so that it comes down right above your eyebrows. There should be about one to two finger span between your eyebrows and the top of the helmet. The strap should come down below the ear. It should make a V here under the ear on both sides and then we want to snap it or close it. It needs to be pretty secure under here. Maybe one finger can get in between the strap and the chin so that when you do, uh, if you do get in an accident or an altercation, it's not going to slip off. It's not supposed to be rolling around on your head or sliding around on your head. How does that feel? Good. Good. That's a properly fitted helmet. Well, thank you, Elaine, and good job, Bailey. We've got the helmets, now we need the bikes, and Bicycles Incorporated has some to show us right after this break. Hey, Al, what you gonna be next? I'm hoping a baseball bat. You? I'm thinking a cookbook. Mm -mm. You guys are lucky. 
Being leader here, we never know. Yeah, we could be carpet, clothes, even furniture. Oops, we gotta go. See you later, leader. <laughs> Buy recycled products. Let them live again. Hey, Al, you got your wish. Beth Bach from Bicycles Incorporated was kind enough to bring in some bikes so that we can address some of the concerns that I have about this MS-150. Beth, I really want to ride in an MS-150, but right now I have a really old mountain bike, and I'm just not sure that it's going to be comfortable enough to ride for long distances. That's my first concern. So uh, with that in mind, what kind of bike would you suggest for a long ride? Well, for a long ride, you actually have a couple of options, but I think from where you're coming from, from a mountain bike standpoint, probably the first thing that I would show you if you came into the store would be a um, fitness hybrid. This is uh, from Trek. It's the 7.5 FX, and it is a women-specific design. The largest segment in the sports field right now in cycling is, um, that's growing is the female population. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the manufacturers are coming up with um, more advanced and technical designs for women to inspire comfort, which will inspire confidence, which will allow you to ride longer and stronger. Okay. All right, what makes it women specific? Because I'm pretty sure that the mountain bike I have is a male, was designed for a male. But right, right. Uh, Most women specifically are shorter, are longer in the legs and shorter in the torso. Okay. And so from that standpoint, a lot of the bikes that we ride are too long. And from a comfort standpoint, you're stretched out, your neck hurts, yeah. you know, your back hurts, and it's uncomfortable. So what they've done is they've shortened the top tube on the bike, they've shortened the chain stays and the seat stays, which allows you to climb better, makes it more comfortable. They've designed women-specific saddles, which have an anatomical relief zone, so nice. you're comfortable for longer rides. Generally, they tend to have shorter handlebars for the width, since we're narrower in our shoulders, mm -hmm. and anatomically designed grips for our hands, because generally our hands are smaller. Okay, can I give it a try? Let's sure. See how this feels. Okay. See. Well, it definitely feels closer up here. I guess I should get it back. Oh, this fits me nicely. Hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, that feels, a feels good. More upright riding position, but still enough of being stretched out to where you can be a little more aggressive in your riding. Oh, that does. That feels really comfortable. And I really like that idea of being upright more. That's something that I really feel is a, a bothers my shoulders even to be lower and, and um, I don't know, that, that feels really good. That feels comfortable. Okay, and how many speeds do we have on something like this? This one is 24. Okay. There's eight in the back and three in the front, which is very helpful. They have a small gear in the front to allow you to get up almost any hill that we have here. Excellent. Yeah, not too many around no. <laughs> my parts, but still, it, sometimes right. they feel bigger than they really are. Okay, and um, the, the tires, they look like they're, I guess, like you're saying, it's a hybrid, so it's not the big, heavy, knobby. Right. It's the, actually the same size tire as you would find on a road bike, oh. but it uses a wider tire. So it can accommodate a lot more different terrain. You could actually ride on gravel or hard packed dirt as well as the street and be comfortable and confident that you will be able to stay upright. Okay, great. And um, now are there any other things that I'm gonna need to have for this bike to be able to ride it on the road or does it come with everything I need? I'm just curious, um, like my mountain bike doesn't have the reflectors. Is that something that I need I, to have? Yes, absolutely. I think the reflectors are important. Um, another thing you can also get is you can actually buy a light system because here in the state of Texas, it is required by law that you have a battery operated front light as well as a reflective device in the back. Okay. And well, uh, I'm sorry. Another thing that's very important when you ride longer distances is hydration. So all the bikes come pre-drilled to put a water bottle cage so you can carry your water with you. Okay, that's a great idea. Speaking of carrying things with us, my second concern is that I need to be able to have my daughter go with me and my real concern is that she ends up weaving into traffic or into the path of oncoming riders and I know that you were aware that my con that was my concern. So tell us a little bit about what you have here because you know, this looks like a, a wonderful option better than towing her with a rope. So <laughs> no, <laughs> what absolutely, what absolutely. Most kids even at the age of from five and up can ride their own bicycles but like yourself being um, a more active mother she you want to go farther than around the block right. so what a lot of companies have come up with is it's like an instant tandem for your bicycle mm -hmm. it attaches to the seat post and allows the child to ride in the back but she also gets to participate it will help her learn her balance 
and then she can also pedal and it she can help and if she gets tired it's based on a free will system where she can stop pedaling and then you can just pull her excellent excellent can she sit on that and Absolutely. see how it goes or why don't you go ahead and sit on there and see so that's a great idea they actually contribute so you're not just pulling them as you would exactly. maybe in a trailer exactly. system but can you but, get up there oops. little lady yeah, and put your hands right here so so what do you think how does that feel well we'll have to give it a try huh Look. what do you think give it a try sometime yeah okay all right great well let's see um some of the features uh, that would make this different than actually being on a tandem because that would be one of my concerns as a tandem is is a pretty big bike to be able to try to haul around. I have right. a, a small car, so um, like you're saying, you're creating a tandem. How how hard is it to put this together or to it's haul this not, around? It's really simple. It's just a, a couple of screws here with Allen wrenches. You loosen them and the, the mount comes off. With this dial right here, you can undial it and it will fold in half. Okay. So it'll allow you to put it in a small trunk or a small vehicle. Okay, excellent. So this actually folds up in half, mm -hmm. and so then you just take this and you can put that, I guess, on a bike rack as well, or on the back of your car, right, or, or something the back like of your that. Car okay, in the trunk, probably best in the trunk. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, let's take a look. Hey, guess what I just saw? Look what's up here. Let's try this out. See this? Go ahead. <laughs> well, this is, look, looks like a fabulous setup. Thank you so much, Beth, for coming in and showing us this fabulous setup. We're definitely going to have to give it a chance and give it a try. But before, no matter what bike you decide to ride on the road, it's very important that your bike has a safety check. So in a moment, we'll have Pete Cox from Bikes for Tykes. He repairs hundreds of bikes a year, and he'll show us what to check right after this. There are over a hundred million households in America. Every one of them different, but they should all have two things in common, a family disaster plan and a disaster supplies kit. Make yours today with help from the Red Cross. When we come together, we become part of something bigger than us all. Welcome back. I'm here with Pete with Bikes for Tykes. Pete, tell us about your organization. Well, thank you, Casey. I'm with uh, Bikes for Tykes. It's an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization. And what we do is we get used bicycles, we fix them up, and we donate them to children of all ages. Okay. And we've been doing it for about five years and done over 6,000 bicycles. Wow. We're always looking for bicycles. We're looking for money, obviously, to help us uh, support this. And we're also looking for deserving kids. And I can be reached at 817 Four four six seven eight seven eight, or our website is www.texasbikesfortikes.org. Okay, excellent. And I will make sure that your information is on my website at the areyoukeepingup.com so that people can get in touch with you. And really quick, if you just, uh, you know, what are the main things that you really need to help keep an organi organization like yours up and, and giving so many deserving kids these bikes? Probably volunteer services, uh, but as a small organization, it's tough to coordinate volunteers and to organize it. And, and we really need to devote some time to it because this could be a, a even bigger project if we had more volunteers. Excellent. Well, and you really know how to fix up bikes. I love to see, I've been a part of you giving bikes to kids and um, actually have one of the bikes that my daughter rides on. And I know that there are several things that a bike needs to, to have working properly. You get them in all, all conditions. What are some of the things that really need to be checked over before you give the bike out? Well, I have a simple method that parents and children can use to check their bikes before each ride. And we call it the ABC hand drop method. Okay. Uh, a stands for air in the tires, and the beauty of this is it only requires a few tools. You'll need a tire pump, preferably one with a gauge. If you don't have a gauge on your pump, you'll need a separate tire gauge to measure the air pressure. You'll need an adjustable or crescent wrench, and for some bikes, like these with the handbrakes, you may need a metric size Allen wrench. As I say, the ABC hand drop. A, you check the air pressure in the tires, and while you're doing it, you check all things relating to the wheel. Make sure they're in there tight, the spokes are good, and the tire is good. B stands for brakes, and you check the brakes, in this case, hand brakes. Uh, if it's a kid's bike with a coaster brake, 
If they're riding it and push back hard, they should be able to skid the back tire. C stands for chain. You want to make sure the chain is properly tight, not too loose, and that it's not rusty. Uh, you also want to check the crank arms and the pedals while you're there, <coughs> and check to make sure that the chain ring isn't bent. Okay. And hand stands for handlebars, and they can come loose one of two ways, either this way or turning. And you want to make sure they're tight. And the D stands for drop. And we suggest picking the bike up about four inches, dropping it, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't hear any rattle or any other strange noises. Okay. And that's the method we teach children. We also teach adults. To make sure everybody out there is riding on safe bikes, puts their helmet on, and so take all that you've learned from this show and really use it to your benefit. And we'll be here next time to show you some other bikes. We're actually going to test some bikes out. We're going to find a training program that can get us ready to ride. Until then, you can see what we're up to at areyoukeepingup.com. Thanks for joining, thanks for watching, and we'll see you out there. Let's roll.